Good morning. Welcome to a fresh week of hashtag LD EduChat Leadership Development in Education Online. And what a fantastic lineup we have for you this week. Today, uh, we've got Leora Crudus, who'll be looking at things that we need to consider moving into 2020, 2021. Tomorrow, we have Hannah Wilson, who'll be looking at flexible working. And is that going to be our new normal? On Wednesday, we dive into educational excellence with Daniel Connor and Joe Miles, two of our heads of outstanding schools in our trust who will be looking at the things they've done along their journey on how they've taken their schools and maintained an outstanding status. On Thursday, we have Amjad Ali, who is a senior leader in education as well as a co-founder of BayMed, and he'll be looking at how we can go about recruiting diverse teams. And then on Friday, a brilliant way to end the week, we have Joe Richardson, who will be looking at school improvement and the things that we need to consider to improve our schools. So that's the week we have lined up for you today. And just a reminder for you, on uh, Twitter today, we've got Adrian Rogers, who's the CEO of Chilton Learning Trust, who will be doing our Twitter takeover of Chilton TSA. So if you're not following us, make sure you follow us at Chilton TSA. Over the next week or so, we'll be making some announcements in terms of what's happening with our program moving away from this academic year and we've got quite a few things lined up for you so watch this space and uh, do keep an eye on twitter as well but without further ado what i'm going to do is jump straight into leora's presentation and i'll join you after the video Morning, colleagues. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on this uh, Monday morning for this session on um, things that we need to consider when we're planning for the next academic year. I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you now so that we can uh, begin the presentation. Right, so we're covering in this session today what must be considered when planning for 20 to 20, uh, 2020 to 2021. First, I'm just going to say a little bit about the Confederation of School Trusts. We are the national organisation and sector body for, sc for school trusts in England. We have three strategic aims to advocate for the sector, in other words, to speak up for the sector, to connect the sector and to support executive and governance leaders. If there are colleagues on, uh, that have joined us today from overseas territories, just so you know, the Multi-Academy Trust is a group of schools working in a single governance structure to uh, improve the quality of education in England. So I think we need to think about continuity planning in the medium and indeed the longer term. So it's important that we're not just locating ourselves either in the crisis response, which is uh, the response that we're in now, or indeed looking forward to next year, the recovery, re the recovery response. We need to think more strategically and in the long term. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as, we, as we go on today. So we know that the impacts of COVID-19 have been in, in, in fact very, uh, very significant. Um, and at CST, we are committed to ensuring that as many pupils as possible return to formal schooling in the autumn, which is the beginning of our next academic year in the safest possible way. So we've been saying to government, there is an urgency now for you to tell us the broad parameters that you want us to plan for, for next academic year. And I'm pleased to say that we expect an announcement from our Secretary of State in this coming week about what those planning uh, parameters are. The other thing we've been saying to government is that they need to take decisions about the whole system. So we can't just talk about how and when we, we, we open schools more widely to all pupils. We also need to talk about accountability. So we need to know about public tests and examinations, what they look like next year. And we also need to know what the funding settlement uh, looks like next year. So at CST, we've been thinking about the impacts of COVID and analyzing the impacts of COVID in three ways. So we've been looking at the educational impact, uh, we've been looking at the uh, social impacts of COVID, and we've been looking at the economic impacts. So I'm just gonna briefly uh, say something about each of these things. So firstly, on educational impact, we know of course, that despite our best efforts, there will be children who have missed out on substantial parts of their education uh, in, this, in this academic year. So when they come back to school next academic year, we are likely to see uh, some gaps in learning, some gaps in knowledge, 
and we're going to have to design a curriculum that attempts to fill those gaps in learning and, and in knowledge. I don't think we'll know the exact size of these gaps in learning or exactly what they look like until we've got all children back and we can undertake a proper diagnostic assessment of where, where the gaps are. So we've got some evidence from the Education Endowment uh, Foundation, which is the, the big research organisation in England, saying that the gap between the most disadvantaged and their peers could widen by about 36%. Um, but we don't know yet if that is the case because we haven't got all children back uh, in, in, into schools. So it's really important that we do that. Secondly, uh, the social impacts of COVID. Now, the first point I want to make, I think, is, is, is very important. There's been a lot of talk about the impact on children's mental health and well-being uh, during the lockdown. That is certainly a source of worry and concern for us. But I think that we should understand that there's no universal uh, experience of or response to the lockdown. So we know some families have been under considerably more pressure, but there will also be families for who this time was uh, relatively happy, uh, where parents uh, supported children in their learning, where there was greater connection in families. So we shouldn't assume a deficit for all children um, in this period. However, worryingly, we know that there's been a significant incre increase in domestic, in domestic violence. And there will be implications of the lockdown for mental ill health, both with, with, with adults and indeed for children. And of course, we know very sadly that some young people and some staff will be bereaved. They will have had to confront the death of loved ones in very, very difficult circumstances, often where they haven't had an opportunity to say goodbye. I think it's also important that we think about families who we were worried about. So there's a group of families who we know we were worried about uh, prior, to, prior to lockdown, and we know who they are, um, we know the set of concerns about those families. There are some families who are at the edge of our concern. So families that uh, were starting to be under a little bit more stress and that we, where we were keeping, keeping an eye. So the pressures on those families may have got considerably worse during lockdown. And I think then there's a group of families who would not have been on our radar at all prior to lockdown, um, but who, for whom the experience of lockdown has been stressful. And we might have some worries now, post lockdown, about those families. And we need to be thinking about how we can offer them our support and the support of the community. So thirdly, the economic impact. Now, colleagues, we can't underestimate the economic impact of COVID. Although the government has put in place safety nets to protect as many adults as possible, for some families, the economic consequences, the economic pressures will be felt for months and possibly years to come. So the strong likelihood is we will see a rise in child poverty, in unemployment, and particularly for our young people leaving school, leaving the statutory education system, a rise in uh, youth unemployment. The job market is probably more difficult than it has been for very many years for our young people. And there's a set of broader welfare issues uh, that go with that. So we need to be confronting that uh, challenge as well. Now, that analysis of those three impacts uh, so the educational impacts, the social impacts and the economic impacts lead CST to consider a set of three principles that we think should underpin school leaders' decisions going forward into the next academic year. These are the principle first of equity. So that is the just provision and distribution of resources to pupils in a way that reflects their needs and requirements, positively impacting on those who have increased vulnerabilities the most significant gaps in learning and have had during the lockdown the lowest engagement with remote education. Secondly, the principle of resilience. We need to build the resilience of our children and young people, of families, of communities and indeed of our school system. So we need to find solutions that adapt well in the face of multiple stresses on individuals, uh, on families, on schools and on the sector. And that is um, a very big task for us. Finally, we've said to government that the issue of uh, flexibility or the principle of flexibility is, uh, is, is important. So we think that while the government 
should set the broad parameters for, uh, for planning for next academic year. They should take into account Public Health England's advice and the advice, the advice of the scientists in the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. So they must take that into account, but they also need to trust leaders to exercise discretion and good judgment to suit their context, the context of the school, or indeed the group of schools, and to take decisions in the best interests of pupils, parents, and communities. So I want to move now, if those are our principles, to the kind of mindset that we uh, need to be, to be thinking about as we go forward into next academic year and indeed beyond uh, next academic year. And I think resilience theory really helps us here. we we'll say a bit more about resilience theory. So we need to pay attention to the language that we're using when we talk about next year and indeed beyond next year. And I particularly like the concept of rising strong. So uh, some colleagues may uh, know that this comes from the work of Brené Brown and it, it, it gives us a way of talking about what we want to achieve without perhaps using the language of recovery because colleagues schools have not been sick in this period. So the idea that we are what we are doing is that we are building resilience, we are rising strong and we will endure as strong is for me a much better concept and a much better use of language. So what do we know about resilience? I'm a particular fan of the work of Anne Maston. So writing in The American Psychologist in 2001, she said something which I find endlessly fascinating. The study of resilience in development, in the development of children, has overturned many negative assumptions and deficit focused models about children growing up under the threat of disadvantage and with the threat of adversity. And COVID-19 has obviously presented a very significant challenge in terms of some families and the adversity that they would have experienced. But the most surprising conclusion, uh, she says, that emerges from the studies of these children is what she calls the ordinariness of resilience, the ordinariness of resilience. So her conclusion is that resilience is made of ordinary rather than extraordinary processes. And she uses a wonderful term. She calls this ordinary magic. So let's now apply this to the school context. I think we need to trust the ordinary magic of schooling and schools. So we need to build educational resilience through the ordinary processes of schooling. And yes, there are challenges. Of course, there are challenges. The size of the gap will be challenging. The disruption to education will be challenging. The disruption to the curriculum will, will, will be a matter uh, of concern for us. But these matters, while they are a grave of concern, are not insurmountable. So we can do this. When a trust sponsors a school, typically the gaps in curriculum and knowledge are often very extensive. And we know that trusts repair these gaps through a systemic approach to the curriculum, allied with precision in pedagogical delivery. So our provision needs to prioritize those pupils who have the most significant gaps in their learning and who have increased vulnerabilities over this period of lockdown. In other words, our equity principle. So secondly, in relation to building educational resilience, that ordinary, ordinary magic of schools, we need to think about curriculum uh, resilience. So there may well be further localized peaks in the virus, and we need to think about the likely scenario of further disruption and local lockdown. So can our curriculum next year cope with this? Can we move in a very agile fashion between delivery from in the classroom, because remember there is absolutely no substitute for the classroom teacher, and remote education? We need to optimise the benefits of each paradigm, and we need to use the learning of lockdown uh, for what we know works in relation to uh, remote education. So colleagues, I've also been uh, saying to government, um, we need to really be very careful about thinking that we can put lots of complexity onto schools. We can do lots of intervention and ask schools to implement lots of different programs. I think introducing complexity at this time will mitigate against the magic of schooling. So the things that school do very, the schools do very well, strong purposeful teaching, a well-planned curriculum, powerful welfare and pastoral systems. A third issue in relation to um, building educational resilience is how we think about the impact 
um, of lost teaching time. So there's been a lot of talk in England about catch up. Um, and at one point, lots of people were talking about um, a summer of catch up, that we can catch up all that lost learning over the summer. And I don't think that's true at all. We can do some things over the summer, but uh, I think the evidence shows that catch up is a long term endeavour and that catch up in, very importantly must be aligned with a teacher's assessment of the gaps in knowledge and with the curriculum that a school or a trust runs. So tuition programmes have the most impact when they are delivered alongside the school or the trust uh, curriculum. So again, citing the evidence from the Education Endowment Foundation, um, we know that evidence-based tuition programs can, can have an impact of, a pos of approximately five additional months progress if they are done in a way that is aligned with, with the evidence. So short regular sessions, Education Endowment says 30 minutes three to five times a week over a set period of time, perhaps the first half term, or the first uh, term, the autumn, the autumn term. This is how you create optimal, optimal impact, not by trying to uh, deploy people who are not qualified teachers over the summer to help children catch up. That, uh, that won't work. So I want to go through uh, some of the evidence-based processes um, and, and approaches uh, with you. This is, this is a very helpful guidance, again, from the Education Endowment Foundation. So they talk about uh, targeted approaches, one-to-one -one small group tuition, intervention programs, and there's a lot more information on the Education Endowment Foundation's website and their promising projects page, and extending the school time. And if you're not familiar with the Education Endowment Foundation's teaching and learning toolkit, I would strongly commend it to you. It's absolutely fantastic in terms of helping us know what the things are that will make the most difference um, in, in children's learning. So those are targeted approaches, but we might also think in a more strategic way about whole school approaches. And as I said earlier, there is nothing that beats the power of a classroom teacher. Um, so we need the highest quality teachers. We need great teaching in September when we uh, hopefully reopen our schools to all children. And there are two great resources that I would commend to you. The first is the Education Endowments Foundation's Teaching and Learning Toolkit. And the second is a resource that has actually just been published in the last week. It's Professor Rob Coe's Great Teaching uh, Toolkit. So we need to put in place uh, mechanisms, professional development, that support our teachers to be the best that they can be. We need to support great teaching. We also need to make sure that uh, we are assessing our pupils and providing very good evidence-informed feedback. And again, I would refer you to the Education Endowment Foundation's guidance on assessing and monitoring pupil progress. Now, while in England, we have prioritised uh, year six to return to school before the summer um, because of the issues around their transition to secondary school. We haven't prioritised year 11 and they're also leaving school. So transition support uh, is, is really important and we need to be creative about the ways in which we are uh, supporting those transition groups to um, make the best possible move into their new school or their new education uh, institution. And finally, colleagues, there's a set of wider strategies that we can think about for next year. So we know in this lockdown period that um, many, if not most parents have been very actively supporting um, their children's uh, learning. And that's one of the great things that has emerged uh, from, uh, from lockdown. So we need to keep that relationship with parents and carers going. We need to keep them involved and engaged in their children's learning. And I would commend to you EEF's guide on communicating effectively with, uh, with parents. There's a lot that we've learned about access to technology. We need to ensure as far as possible that we are bringing about a digital inclusion, particularly for the most disadvantaged families who may not have an internet enabled device in their home uh, or that may be limited uh, to a single, a single phone. Um, and we need to understand what we've learned in the lockdown about the best evidence on supporting students 
to learn remotely, because as I said earlier, there may be local lockdowns where we have to return for a period to remote education. So while I said that I don't think a summer of catch up uh, will, 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 will help a lot and there's not a lot of evidence to support that, I think that there are some things um, that we can do during the summer um, that may help learning, definitely, but will also help to re-socialise children and young people who have been isolated in, in lockdown and uh, may now need to return to physical, emotional and mental well-being. So we can focus on prioritising those kinds of activities um, over the summer. Uh, so I talked earlier about uh, building resilience for children and young people, for families, for communities and for schools. So we need to think about building family resilience in response to social impacts. Remember, we've got those three groups of families who we, who we think we might be worried about. Um, in a post-COVID scenario. And there's only so much that a school can do, that can do here. So CST is saying to, uh, to ministers and um, to senior civil servants that local authorities and health commissioners also have a responsibility here, a duty here. They need to be looking at whether there's sufficient family support provision in their local area. So for example, mental health provision, bereavement support, and provision for adults and children fleeing domestic violence. And of course, the economic, uh, building economic resilience in response uh, to these impacts. I think our young people have an essential role to play in building economic resilience going forward. Particularly, destinations become hugely important. So I think we may need to put more resource than we might normally do into making sure that young people uh, who are leaving school, year 11, um, moving out of school, perhaps year 13s, um, let's make sure they get to the right destination for each and every young person that, the, that, we, um, that we support them to get to the destination of their choice. Uh, we think there's merit in um, proposals like the UPP Foundation proposal, which is recommended a community leadership academy, uh, which is six months full-time or part-time Pay a paid work placement for the most dis disadvantaged young people to help them into the labour market. There's all sorts of things that we could think about um, in, in this space. So finally, colleagues, I, I think all I've said means that for next year or next academic year, we need a strategic approach. So this is something that I think you could be doing with your senior teams and indeed uh, with your governance boards, with either your governing board, if you're a, main, a maintained school, or with your trust board. I would suggest that it's a four-step approach, assess, plan, do, review. Uh, so step one, when we hopefully open schools for all pupils in September, is that diagnostic assessment. We need to understand what the gaps in knowledge are. And those gaps in knowledge are likely to be different in, in different schools, depending on your school's context. We need to understand that first. Then we need to plan what we're going to do. So what is our curriculum plan and how are we prioritising any additional funding? Like for example, in England, the one billion pound tuition fund that the, uh, that the government uh, announced recently. Step three, uh, we need to implement that plan. So ensure that the curriculum and the targeted programmes are fully aligned. Uh, it, what what doesn't work, we know from the evidence, is where we try to bolt on catch up or where catch up or tuition programs are dislocated from the curriculum. So we need programs that are linked in, intrinsically to, to the curriculum and ensure that pupils are benefiting from additional practice, additional feedback. And finally, we need to keep, uh, keep our plans under review, uh, look at the impact of our plans and where necessary, we need to refine our approach so that we ensure that our approach in the next academic year is uh, making the greatest possible impact on narrowing those, those gaps between the most disadvantaged and their peers and catching up uh, those gaps in learning. So I uh, hope you found that useful. And uh, now I'm happy to take any of your questions, uh, your queries, uh, or indeed hear your comments about the ideas I've shared with you. Just end with this. This is uh, CST's uh, value statement, and we believe it is a, a promise that should be made to all, to all children and to all parents in England. A promise that when we set up and run and lead our schools or our trusts, um, that it is based on the principle that there is no trust more sacred than the one the world holds with children. Thank you very much, colleagues.
Welcome back. Um, a lot to uh, think about and lots to digest uh, from that. And I'm hoping from my point of view, it definitely clarified the the, the approaches that we should be looking at uh, and, and definitely what Leora said about making sure that it applies to your setting uh, in terms of where, uh, where you are, your geographical location, your demographics within your area, but also your particular school. So knowing your school well is probably the most important thing. Over on Twitter today, we've got uh, at Chilton TSA, we've got Adrian Rogers, who's the CEO for uh, Chilton Learning Trust. So if you've got any specific questions about what we're doing as a trust, it's a really good opportunity to pose that question on Twitter today, as we've got Adrian on there. But without any hesitation, let's have Leora Credus. Welcome to the E Stage, Leora. Thank you so much, Arv. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here today, Arv. Thank you, thank you for the invitation to uh, this excellent series of webinars that, that you're running. So, Arv, there's a question that um, I've said I would uh, answer live. Question from yep. Marion, who asks, how do we change the narrative of catch-up and recovery, of loss and negative impact that the government and media is perpetuating? So she says, in spite of our best efforts to use different vocabulary, um, any thoughts about engagement and marketing with stakeholders? So this is this is an area that um, uh, I've been I've been giving quite a lot of thought to, and uh, particularly in light of preparing uh, for for this session, it does seem to me that that we that we are a significant risk, as Marion says, of 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 this to telling this negative story. The story that um, lockdown will be, you know, the defining moment of childhood for 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 children and young people, and that um, when we invite children back, um, hopefully in, in September, all children uh, will come back in a traumatized or bereaved uh, state. So, so that that's a narrative that I I, I am quite worried about, um, because I think um, in some cases we can um, over dramatize the impact the impact of lockdown mm. so um and it's, it's one of the reasons why i'm so interested in 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 theories of resilience because i think it gives us a different way uh, of talking about the experiences the children have had while not for a moment denying that some children will come back traumatized bereaved um, and, and possibly suffering mental ill health so it's not for a moment to deny that it's just not to overstate that um, and therefore, uh, I think not to um, make assumptions that we can't resume the ordinary processes uh, of, of, of schooling. So I think in, in answer to Marion's question, I think it's about the language that we use. We can't, we can't control the language the media is, is using, but we can, we can talk positively to, uh, to, to parents. And I, I, I think I use the language of rising strong in the presentation. Um, and there's a um, particular uh, uh, trust, the Embark Federation, which is a, a group of seven primary schools in Derbyshire, who have planned a curriculum that is in fact called Rising Strong, and are to, talking about that to, to their parents and reconnecting with their parents' community by saying, we will rise stronger uh, out, out of this. So I think it's about the language we use, rather than seeking to change change the language that the, uh, that the external environment uses. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can I just tag, uh, not tag on to, but just follow on, Mar Marin did ask another question. I mean, it was more specific to Chilton Learning Trust and Marin, um, as I said, Adrian is actually on the Twitter handle at the moment. So if you want to know what we're doing as a trust, um, it's a good, really good opportunity to ask that directly. But if we broaden that question out in terms of the the dovetailing between moving into perhaps more of a mixed style learning if we're having um, on-site learning and also home learning as well. Um, and the concern that Marin's posed is, is that um, the availability of tutors, especially in more rural areas, that's one of the concerns that we've got. So looking at the geography of our, uh, of our um, country and looking at where our schools are positioned, obviously that is going to have a huge impact on the resources that are available, especially things like tutors. So how, how can they navigate that, uh, that challenge? And obviously, from your position at the Confederation of School Trusts, you speak to a lot of heads. How are they doing the mix between tutor, home learning and school learning? 
I, so, so, so <laughs> apologies. I, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't clear to me that, that, that Marion was posing that question to you as opposed to, to, to me. Uh, and I, in, in the answer to her, um, I said it, it does depend entirely on the context of the particular school or the, or the particular trust and, and also on what the gaps in learning are. So, um, for example, if, if your school serves perhaps a very dis economically disadvantaged area, it may well be that you've got a lot of children coming back into the school um, okay. who wouldn't have accessed remote education in that period because they haven't had the uh, technological resources, to the digital resources to do so. Um, so you will have a very high proportion then of your, of your school with gaps in, in knowledge. So then one-to-one um, -one tuition starts to look impossible in that context and, and you will need uh, to embrace more the kind of group tuition um, uh, style. Um, however, if if your school is perhaps in a, a, a less economically deprived area, uh, it may be that you've got smaller numbers of children um, who come back with gaps in learning and therefore one-to-one -one becomes um, more of an issue. If, if you're particularly worried about your year 10s, for example, the examination group for, for, for next year, um, or indeed your, your year 5s, um, you may well say, actually, I, I'm, strategically, this this is the group I, I need to prioritise in in terms of um, the funding available for tuition. So there's st some strategic decisions to to take here, as well as an analysis of your workforce. So do you have the staff within your own school or your own trust to deploy um, into tuition? For for some for some schools and trusts, the answer to that would be yes. Uh, for others, um, it may be that there are a number of high level teaching assistants, for example, who could be trained uh, to deliver um, uh, tuition, or you've got uh, people who you, you regularly use from supply agencies who are trusted teachers, but not teachers on your substantive staff. Um, and you might want to bring those back. I, said, I, don't, I, I genuinely don't think there's a single answer. I think there are a number of strategic decisions that schools and trusts need to make here, but I'm sure um, Mary would be very interested in Chiltern Learning Trust's approach uh, to, uh, to this. There's a, another question that's come in from Lyndon. Yes. Who was reading last week about priority pupils mm -hmm. because we're not quite sure what their specific needs will be until we've got them back. And we should take care not to box children in by making assertions that they're all from the disadvantaged groups. So, so I've actually said this uh, to government, actually. We need to be really careful about labelling children and assuming that they will come back with particular uh, gaps in learning. So, so the same is, is true for children with special educational needs. Until, so I, th I think we should keep an open mind until we've got them back we don't know which children um, will have, uh, have have gaps in, in their learning. Um, you know, the, I think the evidence would suggest there's likely to be a correlation between um, children who live in economically disadvantaged areas um, and those who have um, not had uh, access to remote education. There probably is a correlation uh, there, but I don't think we should assume that, um, that all children uh, fall, fall into that category. I've, I've really not liked the government's use of children of key workers and the most vulnerable. I, th I think that's a very difficult um, label. So um, sometimes I've seen the, the term priority pupils used in order that we don't use uh, the, those kinds of labels, the labels of, you know, a vulnerable group uh, of, of children. So uh, I, I would absolutely agree um, with, uh, with Lyndon's uh, point. And he, he ends, I think, by asking about what is a good use of assessment. I mean, it's the, it's, this is, comes back to the ordinary magic of schools. It's the assessment that we've always done. You know, I think, I, I think that we can feel cautiously confident, although obviously there's a big challenge ahead of us, but, but we do know how to do this. Um, you know, we're, we've, we're trained as teachers, we're professionally qualified uh, to be able to, to, to do these things. So we should approach this task with, uh, with, with some level of, of, of confidence, I think. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, what you said in your presentation in terms of the mechanisms that we had in place before, don't just abandon those 
just because we think we're entering into a different phase. Um, and, and definitely one of the things I think you also said was that um, just be more strategic in, in, in your approach. It's not about doing different. It's actually, you might have done five assessments next year, but were they meaningful? So do you only need to do three and spend more time on the teaching and the learning side and make the other aspects uh, uh, key points to make sure they actually have meaning? Um, so they're the things I think that, uh, you know, I, I pulled out your presentation is actually not necessarily doing more or different. It's actually just being strategic in your approach and knowing your schools and knowing what works in your schools. That's absolutely right, Alv. Um, you know, uh, uh, approaching this task uh, calmly and objectively um, mm. with, without the, um, you know, catastrophizing that we've seen in the media, a, a calm and objective assessment of the situation, the identification of some strategic options, um, a plan that then is aligned to those strategic options. That's the way to do this. Um, mm. And that's the way we've always worked. Mm. So it's not asking anything um, different of colleagues. I see Kate's posted a question. Government doubling down on compulsory attendance and heads being positioned as weak or obstructive uh, for saying they won't find families. Um, so, uh, so Kate, um, I think was this something that the Prime Minister said? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because I've been preparing for this this morning. I might have um, missed something. Um, I do think it's important that if we are in a position to bring all schools or to open all schools and to bring all children back in September, if we are in that position, because of course we have to be guided by the science, then it really is quite important that we say to parents, attendance is compulsory. Um, and that is not necessarily to be uh, punitive, but to give a very clear message. Um, so I think what doesn't, what I'd be more worried about, Kate, is if the government does not do that, then um, I think that puts school leaders, head teachers in a very difficult position because you're trying then to get children back into school um, and it, it could create an adversarial uh, relationship between the parent and, and the head or the parent and the teacher. So, so I actually think it is quite helpful if the government sets out, actually, you know, um, attendance, attendance at school is a right. It, it is a right actually under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, we, we do expect our children um, back in school and that, that we state that very, very, very clearly. Uh, I, I, I would say in relation to um, potential fining of parents and, and, and punitive action that can be taken against parents, I think I would um, I say that, that well, it's never, it's never been our first, the, the, the plan of first resort, has it? It's never been that. It's always been the plan of last resort. And, um, you know, I, I, I would suggest that it's certainly not something that we would immediately do. So we would encourage uh, parents to send their children back to school. We would talk to them about their fears and anxieties. And it's perfectly reasonable that they've got fears and anxieties. Absolutely, so ab absolutely reasonable that they do. Mm -hmm. But the one thing we do know is that, that um, the parents and, and indeed the public do trust teachers and do trust head teachers. And in fact, they trust teachers and head teachers more than they trust politicians. So teachers and head teachers are the right people to be having those encouraging conversations, to be allaying concerns and fears and anxieties. But it is the job of government to set up that very strong um, expectation um, that if we're in a position to do so in September, that attendance is compulsory. And I think at any one point we can pick up on um, dozens of stories that are pro and against, and it's taking that broad balance. And, and I think it always comes back to the same thing is the students knowing their community and engaging with their community. And I don't think it's, uh, it's never been more important than it is now, the engagement with the parents, the other stakeholders that support your schools, because ultimately uh, it is something that we're gonna have to move together in with your community rather than something that's imposed on the community. I think the implication of that is, is that school is an imposition on, on the community. And if you don't come, then we're gonna fine you. Um, but actually most schools, and every single person that I've come across, they are actively engaged in uh, sub doing surveys and, uh, and engaging with the parents, guardians, third parties and their students to see exactly where they're at. And I think uh, you just having that confidence. 
and saying, you know, and taking that lead. So um, where do you want to jump to next? Uh, so Kate's come back uh, with, with, a, with a question yeah. about um, the more equitable distribution of catch-up funding. Yeah. Um, so Kate, just in answer to that, uh, the catch-up funding, the one billion that was announced by government, is actually in two parts. Um, there's a 650 million and a 350 million part. The 350 million part is for a national tuition program, and that will be um, a program that is procured. So uh, external, I suppose, evidence-based tuition tuition programs, and then the 650 million, which is going to go to schools. So we don't yet know what the funding formula or the funding allocation is for schools. But what we do know is, uh, or, or what, what we've been told thus far, is that that, um, that funding um, won't, th th there won't be strings attached to that, other than, um, you know, the, the imperative to spend the money in, in the way that Parliament intends. In terms of the just and equitable distribution of that funding, that is a strategic decision for um, the head teacher or for um, the executive head or indeed um, the CEO of a trust uh, to make along with those responsible for governance. Ba basically, it's down to us to ensure the just and equi equitable distribution of that funding, Kate. Um, I hope that's a good answer for you. So uh, where do you want to jump to next? So Stephen um, has posted a, a comment agreeing with uh, my, my, my view that what's needed is, is, um, is a strategic plan mm. and saying school leaders need to be trusted um, in, in terms of making the right decisions uh, for, for their, uh, their communities. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's absolutely right, Stephen. Um, and that, that's been an absolutely key principle in all the discussions that we've been having with government. You know, don't, don't try to layer on this complexity mm. to schools. Don't do, you know, lots of grants with lots of different conditions uh, attached. You've got to trust leaders and teachers to be making the best decisions for their children and for their communities based on their intimate knowledge of, of children and communities. Um, so, um, so, so thank you very much uh, for, uh, for that. I think Claire's posed the question, is the shortest question, but probably the biggest question <laughs> um, regarding um, Ofsted. Um, yes, Claire, the million dollar question. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, we don't know uh, what Ofsted will look like in the autumn. Um, and we definitely don't know um, whether Ofsted will be checking on catch-up spending. Um, so that is something that is rumoured. Um, that's, I think, not um, based on very good evidence. So Claire, we do expect an announcement this week um, from our Secretary of State about the planning, uh, planning parameters. Um, and um, I certainly hope um, that we will also be getting this week Ofqual's consultation on the arrangements uh, for examinations next summer uh, and some clarity about Ofsted. Mm -hmm. So um, sorry not to be able to answer more categorically on that one, but I think we need to wait uh, for that announcement to understand um, what, what is planned for, for Ofsted um, uh, before, we can, before we can answer that one. Just, just out of interest, I'm kind of putting you on the spot from a CST point of view. Um, have you got any views on what that could look like in terms of having a look at, say, inspections, etc.? Uh, so obviously, um, CST uh, is uh, in dialogue with um, Ofsted, as you would expect, mm -hmm. um, as we are with Ofqual and the DfE and with ministers. Um, and I should say, as are the other professional associations and sector organisations. Mm. Um, so, so many of us are, are having those, those conversations uh, at, at the moment. Um, what I'm not at liberty to do today, because <laughs> of <laughs> confidentiality agreement, um, is say uh, what the nature of those uh, conversations uh, are, I, I'm, I'm afraid. So, sorry to that's, disappoint you there. That's fine, I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand that. <laughs> So we've got a question from um, Ola. Yeah. Uh, what plans are in place to bring parents together to share the strategic plans of e each school? So again, that's um, that's not 
that's not for me to to tell CST's members um, what to do uh, because you know coming back to this principle of you know your parent body you know your communities um, best so 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 perhaps I, Ola, if you don't mind I'll sort of reflect that question back to the people uh, on this call I would hope you are putting in place plans to share your strategic plans with your parent body. I would hope that you are um, looking at mechanisms for keeping the connection um, with, with parents live in this process. And that once we are clearer about what we're being asked to do in the autumn, um, that you will start talking uh, to, to parents um, ab ab about that. Uh, you know, it's, ab it's absolutely essential that, um, that head teachers, teachers, leaders, um, build the confidence of the parent body and of the community because you are trusted, you are trusted to do so. Um, so this is not me passing the buck to you. Um, I think this is about uh, our strategic leadership, our civic leadership in, in this time is to provide that reassurance to, uh, to parents um, and communities. I have had one question that's come through on Twitter. Uh, it's from T uh, CTG uh, Training. Um, any advice on teacher training providers in response to COVID? Uh, really interesting. So um, I, I think anecdotally, although I think there is some now also some evidence from the department um, that we are seeing a spike mm. in um, teachers wanting to enter the profession. And I think that is very good news for us. Um, so that actually typically happens um, in, a, in a time when the, the job market starts to retract uh, teaching. There's much more interest in, in, in teaching. Um, I would hope, though, it's also because, um, you know, teachers have had such uh, an important job of work and such an important profile in their communities um, over, over this period that, that has meant that just like um, there's a lot more interest in, in NHS jobs, at the moment, there's mm. also a lot more interest in, um, in, in working in education. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's great. It, it, it was that question in relation to initial teacher training providers or in relation to newly qualified teachers of, is it clear? Uh, it was, I think it will probably be to do with uh, entering the profession, so. The NQT. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, NQTs. I think it's a broader question as well in terms of just providers in general, in terms of the approach. To, so whatever level of uh, mm. entry you're looking at. Um, so whether it's ITT or NQT. OK, um, so those entering the profession, um, but particularly, I think, newly qualified teachers um, may have had uh, a little bit of a difficult period uh, mm. during lockdown, because, of course, normally they would be um, they'd be in school they would be teaching part-time, they'd be honing their skills, they'd be um, with a professional community of other teachers from whom they, they, they could learn. And then all of a sudden, for three months, um, they've, uh, they, they, they perhaps have done some, some work in, in, in schools um, in, in terms of the sort of educare provision, um, but, but certainly it's not the experience that they will have had. Um, so, uh, um, the ser series like the ones that you've put on have um, become, I think, essential mm. for, for those NQTs. But as we return, uh, hopefully in, in the autumn, I think just as we are making some strategic des decisions about what we do for our children, what the gaps of knowledge are and, and how we design a curriculum uh, for, for our children. So we need to do exactly the same for our NQTs. Um, because they will have missed out a significant part of their NQT year, there will be some gaps in their professional knowledge. We need to understand what those gap, gaps are, assess what those gaps are, and then put in place a curriculum for them in mm. the same way as we're putting in place a, a, a curriculum um, for, for our young people. Um, and I, I wonder how many colleagues on this call are familiar with the early career framework, um, which I think is perhaps um, one of the most important, you know, pieces of policy, probably since 2010, is a very, very significant piece of policy. It's a framework that is entirely evidence informed um, that will help schools and trusts 
to put in place our curriculum. Now there's an early rollout of that early, of that, um, early career framework or ECF um, in, in, particular er in particular areas from next academic year and then from the following academic year it becomes compulsory. But if, you, if you're not familiar with the early career framework and you're thinking about your newly qualified teachers, I would suggest to you take a look at it. Um, take a look at the materials that the four providers um, who've been commissioned to provide curriculum materials for early career teachers. Those aren't published yet. Um, we expect them to be published in August. Um, but they are um, Ambition Institute, uh, Teach First, um, Teacher Development Trust and the Institute of Education, UCL Institute of Education, are the four, the four providers. Um, all of them are very busy at the moment turning mm. that early career framework into curriculum materials. So great if we can use these curriculum materials that will be free um, to put in place a proper curriculum for our early career teachers uh, in the autumn term. We're just coming towards the end of our session. Um, trying to think, is that the same question from Stephen that we've answered? Shall I take that one? Yeah, we'll take that one. I think then that'll be the way we can end. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so Stephen, um, in your experience, Multi-Academy trusts that collaborate and support their schools are in a stronger position, but schools that are still part of local authorities are sometimes left to struggle. Oh yes, that's so true, Stephen. Um, so I guess I would say this, wouldn't I? But I really do believe that what we've seen in COVID-19 is that the strongest and most resilient of all types of school structure is the group of schools working together in a multi-academy trust. And mm. that is because the trust has been able to put in place um, immediately the kind of support the teachers and leaders have needed. Uh, so, you know, the estate support, the HR support, the workforce analysis, um, thinking about the curriculum e e even. So, um, so I, I would suggest the task now, the task for us now, in a non-ideological way, because I don't think academization per se necessarily solves anything, but there is enormous power in a group of schools working together in a strong and collaborative structure. And at the moment, the legal vehicle for that is the multi-academy trust. Um, so I think it is incumbent upon those of us who are working in those strong and resilient structures, in those trusts, to be able to reach out uh, and support um, a local maintained school um, if, 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 they need, if they need support. I, I think that is part of our civic responsibility as multi-academy trusts. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, a good point to end, I think. Um, and um, as I said, the, you, the schools and mats, and LA's hopefully, and I know ours has been very active all the way through, because obviously not knowing how we're moving forward and what's going to come next. Um, and at what pace that's going to come out. Uh, planning has been a fit since we locked down. So um, mechanisms, I think, a majority of trusts and schools have put in place to see um, all the different aspects that you've discussed today. And they should have a, a, a very good handle on where they are today and how they're going to move forward based on the information, especially coming out this week, um, but obviously between now and September. So I think that there's a lot of assurance there. And I think a couple of good points there in terms of making sure that that is not shouted about but people and stakeholders know that that's what's been going on and I think communication I think definitely has improved during this whole process in, in the new way that we've had to communicate um, so I think from that point of view I think the media will always say what they need to say one way or the other good and bad um, for or against um, but just stick to the uh, the people that that um, you trust as an organization, which is your community and the various institutions and, and, and have your plans. And I think moving forward, I think we are in a strong position based on what you've said and um, from what we've heard that um, there's a lot of things that we're doing right anyway. Exactly. You know, and it's, it's having the fear, it's, it's having the confidence to think that that was working then, it will work in whatever the new normal is and, and, and be strategic in your approach. So I just want to thank you, um, Leora, for sharing what you shared with us today. Um, and I know the comments that have been coming through on Twitter have been like, it's given a sense of clarity, I think, which is, I think we're always looking for is clarity at the moment. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and um, and just an honest approach in terms of how we move forward. So thank you, Leora, for the time that you've put into uh, putting all of this together for us. Pleasure. Thanks, Arv. Lovely to be with you. Bye bye.
Thank you. Right, that's the end of our first session of the week. And as I said, it, it's, it's, it's part of the journey. Um, and hopefully the, the, the resources that we send out to you on the back of today's session, especially um, if you're in, in a senior leadership position, will help you navigate the months that we have ahead. So going back to this week, uh, tomorrow we have Hannah Wilson, who will be looking at a flexible working and will that be part of the new normal? And then on Wednesday, we have educational excellence. We have Daniel Connor from Channel, uh, Cholney High School for Boys, which has been uh, an outstanding school for many years. And we'll, we'll look at their journey and how they've maintained that. But also we've got Joe Miles from Cholney High School for Girls, who recently went from a double RI over the last few years to an outstanding, um, which I've got to say is an outstanding feat in itself. And we'll have a look at their journeys on Wednesday. Thursday we've got Amjad Ali who's a senior leader in education and we'll be looking at how do we uh, recruit a diverse team which is very um, in line with everything else that we've done in terms of the inclusivity that we need within our educational structure uh, the webinar that we had uh, a week and a half ago which was the springboard to have further discussions so uh, Amjad Ali from Baymed um, we'll be discussing that. And then fantastic Joe Richardson, who will be rounding off the week with uh, school imp uh, improvement and what should our priorities be moving forward. So this is uh, me, Arv Kaushal, ending another week. Follow us on uh, our Twitter handle, which is at Chilton TSA, at Chilton TSA, uh, for all the news that's coming out to do with what we're doing currently and what's coming up next. So this is me, Arv Kaushal, signing off for another session of hashtag LD EduChat, leadership development in education online, and I shall see you soon. Thank you.